Okay, hello everyone. I'm Marco Amador, software lead for data engineering and SRE at ANOVA, and I'm here to present a little bit about ANOVA's journey on GitOps and progress delivery. So ANOVA is the global uh, leading provider of industrial IoT, and is the result of a merger of five uh, well-established companies. And with that, uh, we had um, five platforms and five different ways to build software and deliver it. So we created a new platform trying to follow the cloud native culture and best practices and created the Unify platform. The platform uh, that we've created as a state-of-the-art tech stack, a cloud-based tech stack, we are running everything on Kubernetes, on um, Istio service mesh, and with a pretty nice observable stack uh, like uh, Prometheus and, and Loki and so on. Uh, we had a few key aspects to take care when creating a new platform from scratch. One of those was scalability. We needed our clusters and workloads to scale automatically uh, accordingly to the load. And we needed to create um, a multi-geography and a multi-region uh, clusters because we need to segregate the data from different geographies from our customers and uh, multi-region basically for data replication and redundancy. Um, we have multiple environments, staging and uh, production in all of those geographies. And of course, we needed to enforce our security policies in all of these clusters. Uh, uh, more importantly, we have different product teams that we wanted to have completely full ownership on their infrastructure and uh, applications. So we also need to, a way to configure the roles and the tenants themselves. Um, and for that, we used uh, GitOps. More specifically, Flux. We started with Flux V1, and for a while now, we are using Flux V2, uh, which um, bring us a few controllers, uh, source controller to handle all our Git repositories, customized controller that uh, applies customize on those Git sources and create the, the Kubernetes resource themselves, and Elm controller to take care of the Elm releases and perform all the Elm operations that we need to install our Elm releases. Uh, as I said, we need multiple Git repositories, one of them to our platform team, basically where we describe all of our Elm releases for operations related, like the observability stack, the Istio service mesh, uh, the tenants themselves, we need to specify here, and the permissions. Uh, and each tenant has their own uh, Git repositories where they describe their own uh, workloads uh, at will. So with so many geographies and environments and regions, we needed a way to keep our repositories uh, without duplicated code and something to prevent drift between so many uh, uh, environments. Uh, for that, as I said, we are using Elm releases from Flux is a CRD and customize that allow us to apply overlays on top of some base or common base manifests. And then we can apply the small difference that we have between environments while keeping the base, uh, the base clean and without duplicated code. Uh, yeah, I usually show my repos. I have uh, some example repositories on my GitHub that we can check after this. Well, how do we continuously deliver our uh, workloads? We use a pretty nice feature of Flux as well, which is the image automation 
that brings two additional rep um, controllers. One, the image reflector that keeps fetching the new image tags that we are keeping pushing in our CI pipelines. And another one that uh, matches or try to match our image policies with those image tags that we are finding on our uh, container registries. If any of those match the image policy with the new tag, a new patch is uh, applied in our or in any Git repo that reference that image policy. And then we'll roll out the new uh, Elm release with the new version. But not so fast, because sometimes we don't want to simply roll out uh, the new image, because a lot of things or a lot of bad things can happen. We might be introducing a regression. We might be missing some integration tests that we forgot to, to do. Or even suddenly, we might, our APIs might start taking longer than our SLO allows. So we are using Flagger to that as many deployment strategies, canaries, A-B testing, and blue and green. We are mostly using canaries, where the principle is very simple. We start or we spin up new containers using the new image that we detected in our image policy and start progressively sending or forwarding traffic to those containers. And during that, which is called the canary analysis, we, we keep monitoring the metrics or whatever we want to see if the SLO still complies. If everything is OK, the canary is promoted to the primary uh, workloads. Yeah, here is the kind of the chart that explains this a little better. We start progressively uh, forwarding traffic to the canaries. If everything goes well, keep increasing that uh, amount of traffic. And if everything is OK at the end, the, um, the primary release starts using the new version, and the canaries are killed. Uh, Sometimes we don't have enough traffic to have metrics. So the canaries wouldn't progress without the metrics for us to analyze. So we can use different strategies, like using generate our own traffic, uh, like using tools like A or K6, where we can perform loading tests uh, during the canary analysis. Uh, while looking and seeing how the canaries are progressing. We can keep seeing this in our dashboards to see how the canaries are performing. Um, the canaries are ephemeral. Uh, we test it, and the canaries only last while we are doing the canary analysis. Sometimes we want to keep the new version not being um, exposed to all of our users. So we are using dark launches, uh, where uh, for the case that we cannot test a new feature using Feature Flex, for instance, uh, when we start using a completely new architecture, we wanted to uh, make available the new, completely new version to only a specific set of users. And for that, we are using um, an issue virtual service feature, which it's called delegation, where depending on uh, an HTTP header, for instance, we can delegate the traffic to another virtual service from, from Istio. In this case, if anyone knows the header side dark, we'll hit the new versions that I'm releasing and are available only for the users that know that specific header. We can keep running canaries the same uh, we have all of this set up in our uh, Elm charts. And different to the canaries, when the canary analysis finish, we still have the new version available for the ones that know that specific header. And basically, it's what we have been doing in, with GitOps and progressive delivery. Uh, we still have a few challenges, like 
we needed to, we have a different observability stack uh, in on every um, cluster. We'd like to have a, an unified, for instance, uh, observability stack. And that's it. I hope you enjoy it. We do have time for questions, if you want to take a question. Uh, just go to the microphone if you'd like to do a question. There's a microphone in the middle. If somebody's up front, you can wave your arms and I'll throw a mic at you. You have four minutes. Any questions? We got one, I'll bring the mic over. Thanks for the presentation. It was a very good and very interesting part, so I liked your choice of the stack. Just one question. You mentioned that uh, for the Canary release, you don't have sometimes real data, so you yeah. uh, uh, execute tests, for example. Is the quality enough to be sure that it's uh, good enough to release it? Because you're creating tests on your own. Maybe it's not really the behavior of the users you're trying to see. True, true, but we are using uh, uh, specific containers for that specific service where we define a bunch of uh, case tests that we perform. To sh I, I think probably is even more ac accurate because we can just go through every endpoint that we have to test it, while if you are only getting traffic from outside, we might be eating only a few of those services, and then we are not really an uh, analyzing the canary correctly. Any other questions? Raise your hand or go to the mic in the middle of the room. We have a taker. Raise your hand if, you saw, if you're going to have a question as well, and I'll get you set up next, or line up. Go ahead. I was just wondering, how are you keeping Istio and Flux up to date in your production clusters? Uh, well, we are, we are keeping updated uh, with basically manual. We are right now we are using Istio 13, I guess it's pretty updated, and the Flux is the, uh, the only thing that we actually are not using image automation, but we could also use image automation to to update. Uh, flux itself, but we are not doing that. We are actually performing because we want to test first in staging. We are doing flux install and so on. But flux, it's uh, in its own GitOps repos repository. So we are doing everything as code, but we are updating that uh, our operations GitOps Git uh, manually with the flux CLI itself. Yeah. Thank you. Hi. Yeah, really enjoyed the talk. Um, how are you securing your Git repositories to to make it so that only kind of privileged people can, you know, push uh, new code to production? Yeah, basically we have uh, we are we have everything on Azure, so we have AD groups that uh, only the members of a specific tenant only have access to that GitOps repository that they own. Thank you. Yeah, got another one? Yeah, thank you for the presentation. So how do the application team and the developer uh, sort of interface with Flux? Do they decide the threshold for A-B testing and yes, how completely. is that configured? Yeah. Uh, we have one single Elm chart that supports, it's very flexible, so they can uh, decide what latency they, basically they can decide their SLO for that specific service. That can be latency, can be error rate, can be whatever they want. They have complete ownership. The Elm charts are flexible enough to be configurable as we want. All right, thank you, Omar. Everybody give a round of applause. Thank you.